All right, great. So as I mentioned before, today we are going to be talking about tapping into the power of play uh, with Mark. Um, this is what we are going to cover today. Uh, I'll give a little introduction about BSD education um, and then pass it over to Mark to um, lead us through the discovery of uh, what play is. Um, and then towards the end, we will have some time for uh, Q&A. So keep your questions coming throughout uh, the webinar. Uh, I will log them in the chat. So um, whenever you have a question, um, just feel free to pop it into the chat box um, and we will come to it at the end. So a little bit about BSD education. Um, we are a international team of educators and technologists. Um, we are passionate about empowering teachers to bring digital skills into their classrooms. So as part of the education team, we do this um, by thoughtfully designed curriculum and professional development um, that is supported by our on through our online learning platform. Um, and here we have Mark um, to tell you more about himself and let's discover more about play together. So I'll stop sharing screen and hand it over to Mark. Thanks, Eva. Um, yeah, let me just share my screen and we'll pick up. Um, actually, Eva, can you enable me to share the screen? Yes. Thank you. Should be able to do that now. <clears throat> All right, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm the Vice President of Education at BSD. If you've uh, been a part of our webinar series before, you've seen uh, me and, and probably Eva discuss before. Um, I'm currently working in the uh, high level with our company about how does all of our curriculum link to uh, pedagogical standards. I also help with professional development and uh, I'm a PhD student at Chiang Mai University in Northern Thailand, which is where I'm coming to you live from. And um, I'm uh, researching artificial intelligence and play-based learning. And uh, eventually I'll be able to share more about my research once it's published. But uh, let's talk more about the topic for today, which is uh, play. And so the first question I kind of want you to uh, think about and reflect on is, is what exactly is play? It, it may seem like a silly question because everyone kind of has an idea about what play is, but if we had to define it in some way, how would you define it? I'm gonna let you think about that uh, before we come back to the answer to that question. But since this is a webinar about play, I kind of wanted to do a fun little introductory approach. So uh, what better way than to ha have a little play-based experience? So uh, Eva and I are gonna do this, but uh, you're certainly welcome to follow along. And if you're watching the recording, you can press pause and, and uh, find something around your house, around your desk, in your office within kind of a close reach some kind of a, an item, a prop, an accessory that represents something about your culture. Uh, and, when, and when I say culture, uh, that's also a word that, that we could define and, and look at, but it, it doesn't have to necessarily be your ancestral culture or your current culture, but just anything at all that you, know, you think embodies or identifies something about your culture. Then we'll take just a minute to share and talk about it. Uh, and this is kind of just a starter activity and uh, it's one example of how you could slowly start to engage your students with a, a playful activity um, to kind of get things going. So uh, I'll share my uh, prop first. Uh, I've got uh, this uh, hat here. This is a, a genuine Texas cowboy hat because I was born and raised in Texas and uh, you know now living in Thailand. Um, but uh, yeah, my, my culture, you know, most people, if you've never been to Texas, the most people think like, oh, does, does everybody just wear cowboy hats and ride horses everywhere? And uh, the answer is actually kind of true. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of that. And uh, my family, uh, you know, we, we, I grew up with horses and cattle and, and farming and ranching and, and boots and hats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I wouldn't consider it part of my normal attire these days, although I still throw the hat on sometimes so that that's just really to protect my head from the sun. Um, but yeah, so Eva, what, did, what about you? Did you find any item or anything that you could share? Um, actually, I did have a couple of things. Um, when Mark first asked me about it, I kind of had an existential crisis. <laughs> I was like, what is my culture? Um, as I am ethnically, Chinese, but um, I grew up in Canada and also um, have uh, friends from different different cultures as well. So actually, I'm going to totally go left field or some may call this lazy, but I got my phone here. 
this is part of my culture. Um, it's part of my work culture, my my everyday life culture. And in Hong Kong, especially, and in Asia, everyone is clutching their phones. Um, and a big part of this is, one, they are just on social media. Um, but one thing that you'll see everywhere is um, once you're in restaurants, the phone eats first. And that means that we <laughs> always take a picture of the food before we eat it <laughs> and that might be for sharing for social media and for me it's really to share with my parents um they will see like oh, okay eva's eating uh, she's she's okay and that's a big part of my um heritage as well because sharing food and making sure you're fed and and um healthy is how people show love um oh, in okay. in our family so yeah this is my this is my prop. <laughs> it's my phone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's that's nice, Eva. Um, you know, and it, it's it's funny because uh, I think it's probably more than just uh, in your culture that people are using their phones as much and taking pictures of <clears throat> their food. I know I take pictures of my food. Uh, you know, but typically I only take pictures of my food if it's if it's something special. Yeah, I don't take a picture of like every, <laughs> every meal. But uh, you know, if it's if it's something that's pl was plated really nicely at a restaurant, then yeah, I'll, I'll grab a picture of it. But I'm I'm not typically like a, you know, sharing my food on social media. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is just an example of an activity that you could do. It's called a starter activity. Uh, or an engage activity, you know, as educators, we're all used to these types of activities to kind of kickstart any uh, adventure and learning. But uh, what I want you to think about is how can you um, bring in a little bit of element of play alongside that? Because when students are um, invited to play, they're going to be a lot more uh, interested in, in participating. So uh, let's go back to the question I asked earlier, what exactly is play? And um, during the, the course of uh, investigating the, the massive amount of research that there is on this topic, um, I came to the conclusion that uh, even amongst researchers, there is uh, speculation and also uh, disagreements about the term play. So I'm going to try to identify the definition of play the way that the way that, that, that we kind of use play at BSD in our curriculum, uh, but also just kind of in general in the realm of education. So I've got this uh, box here, and I'll go through the left hand side first. So uh, specifically in the realm of education, we think that that play ought to be structured so that uh, you know there there are some rules, there are some goals, there are some you know direction of which the play is meant to be headed in. We also think that play should allow for tinkering or iteration, changes, adaptations. We think that play should be inclusive, which means that every child should be able to participate. And we also think that uh, one key um, area in, in which we should consider with play is that we, we should uh, design play so that the child has more agency uh, and, and you know, it could kind of start off maybe with, with less agency, but the goal would be to move towards more agency. And I'll, I'll talk more about these as we go through the webinar, but I kind of wanted to start off by painting this picture of, of this specific definition of play in education. Now, on the other hand, you know, we, you know, I'm not saying that other types of play are bad. Uh, this is this list here is kind of the the play that you would see on the school ground, after school, you know, in between lunch. Uh, so typically, it's less structured. There are less rules. Uh, there, there there may possibly be no end to it. Uh, but one thing that we also see happening in schools is that this type of play is really only used as a uh, as a merit, you know, for good behavior or it's a reward of some kind. Uh, and then sometimes it's mostly teacher led and the students just have to follow along with what the teacher does. So while this type of play does have a great benefit and there is a room for this type of play to exist, what we want to talk about is how to design structured uh, activities in play that uh, align more closely to goals that we have in education. So I hope that kind of paints a, the picture for how we will unfold play-based learning uh, in, through the rest of the webinar. So um, Eva, what do, you, what do you see the, the student in the, on the left-hand side of this picture? What, what is the student doing? He's playing with a car, but there are books, a lot of books around him. <laughs> right, and then the-, oh, the, the, the or, the, sorry. Or, or he's probably using the books and as props to play with the car. Yeah, yeah maybe. <clears throat> yeah. And then what about the one on the, on the right? Um, looks like uh, playtime, recess. 
Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the, the question is, when is play acceptable? So Eva, of these two pictures, which one would you say would be an acceptable time for play based on the, you know, the stigmatization of play in schools? Um, so in schools, I guess recess would be, would be the appropriate time. So on the picture on the left, like typically the teachers might, oh, um, please put your toy away right. and focus back onto your books. Exactly. So we've got Andy here. I'm going to call him Andy. I don't know why, but it's just a, a stock image. He's playing with his car that he probably bought, brought in his backpack or in his pocket to school. And, uh, you know, maybe it's math time, it's algebra time. Algebra isn't as exciting to him uh, or it's not engaging. And so he's going to bring out the car and, uh, you know, play and be silly. Or Andy is uh, maybe maybe he's like a super advanced physics, uh, you know, learner. And he's actually studying linear equations and graphing them on paper with based on uh, his understanding of the car's movements. I don't really know, but it's a stock photo. It's really just meant to, to beg the question about when is play acceptable? And uh, like, like I mentioned earlier, there's this kind of stigma that we have about the word play in schools uh, where it's appropriate in some places and at certain times, but not in other places. But regardless of that, play is the natural state of being for a child. And um, whether you agree with that or not, um, you know, research has shown it. Uh, but I think that uh, if any person who's ever spent any amount of time with a child is going to understand the truth of that statement, play is the natural state of being for children. They're going to engage in play. They're, they want to play. They, they, um, if, if, if you leave a, a child alone in a room to their own devices, they're going to find something to play with. You know, it's just, it's just the way that, that children are. And I, I beg also uh, to mention that adults also are, are uh, you know, put into this place where their natural state of being is playful, but we've, we've kind of squashed it away, you know, and we've become intelligent adults who, ha you know, have adult lives, but uh, I, I certainly like to play a lot, and I'm sure that if you had the opportunity to play, you would as well. Um, so, um, Eva, you, you, have a, you have a young child who will be entering the, the school soon, right? Uh, and, and, and I don't know if you, if you started planning out what school and all that kind of stuff as parents do, but um, uh, do you agree that uh, a good education ought to provide experiences for children that are meaningful, joyful, socially interactive, actively engaging, and iterative? Yes, absolutely. What, what about the, that list of things like it, it excites you as a parent? Um, I think joyful um, and actively in, uh, engaging and meaningful, those three um really jump out to me um i think even for myself just reflecting back to my own learning when i enjoy something when i when i understand the connection of what i'm learning with to the real world that's when i what that's when the learning sticks for me those are the lessons that i remember most um even back to like primary primary school or um yeah those playful <laughs> moments yeah. Um, in the classrooms always stand out the most. Well, I, I think that if we were to ask this question to pretty much any parent on the planet, you know, do you want your child engaged in, in this list of activities? They're going to say yes, right? <laughs> I mean, I think it's a no brainer. But um, what, what's funny about this list is that all of these things are actually the characteristics of play. So Lego uh, has done a lot of research into play naturally, I guess, you know, because they're the world's largest producer of toys for children. Um, but they've done, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe 20 years worth of research into, uh, you know, what are the different aspects of play? What are the benefits of play? And, and, and how do children um, interact with other children during play? So it's a really fascinating um, kind of a set of, of research of which we'll share some links and stuff as we go through the, the webinar. But the, uh, characteristics of play that have identified by Lego are these five things. Play is meaningful, it's joyful, it's socially interactive, it's actively engaging, and it's also iterative. So in this research and identifying what the characteristics of play are, uh, they also found out that when students are engaged in play, that these five skills are what students are learning. So I could ask the same question to you, Eva. Do, do you want your child to be uh, you know, doing physical things, social things, creative things, building emotional intelligence and, and thinking creatively with, with their cognitive abilities? 
yeah, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's kind of a no brainer. That's, that's really what we want uh, our children to be doing at school. Um, but uh, what, what the research is showing is that play is actually the, the best way for students to build these skills. So the question I want to ask is, as educators, as learning designers, as leaders, how can we provide more opportunities for play inside the classroom? We, we, we allow play to happen on, in the gym and in a recess, et cetera, but uh, let's talk about how we can bring this into the classroom and take advantage of the child's natural state of being, which is to be playful. Um, I like to use this quote from uh, Seymour Papert, and uh, you've probably heard me talk about Seymour Papert before in other webinars, uh, because uh, at BSD, all of our curriculum is built on the pedagogical foundation of constructionism, which is, uh, you know, a, a um, kind of a, a learning psychology that Seymour Papert and his uh, peers and colleagues developed. But Seymour Papert says that rather than pushing children to think like adults, we might do better to remember that they are great learners and try harder to be more like them. Uh, so one of the things that Seymour Papert would do is um, he would uh, conduct research with students and, and um, he would use Lego. And he would, uh, you know, maybe just like drop a box of Lego uh, on a table and, and, and ask, give a student a prompt and say, um, could, could you make some kind of a vehicle delivery system with, the, with this pile of Legos? Uh, so it's kind of this open-ended thing and there, there's no, you know, d direct aim. There's some kind of a, a objective and agenda, which is part of that structured uh, idea of play that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then he would w watch and monitor students and then um, kind of uh, see what they did. Uh, but the funny thing that Seymour Papert would also do is that he would work alongside with the kids and play with the Legos and build things himself to be a, a role model for that active engagement in, in play. So, you know, I think that as educators, we also ought to, you know, put, put ourselves in that situation and, uh, you know, be playful as well. Uh, Eva, do, do you ever find yourself playing with with your child, with your daughter? Do, do you ever like jump in and and uh, you know play with the Legos or play with the the toys? Yeah, I think I think modeling is something that is so important because oftentimes, like my daughter would just follow me around. Like if I vacuum, I she vacuums. Like <laughs> so, if I want to get her off a screen from watching YouTube all the time, I just then hop on to where the Lego is and then I start building and then she sees me do it and then she hops over. I actually have a little Duplo person here right now, actually. Oh yeah, that's cute. <laughs> Legos everywhere. <laughs> um, yep, and I step on it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, we've all, we've all had that experience. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, so, um, what I want to do now is, you know, I, I've shared about kind of what our definition of play is and uh, some, some stimulating conversation about it. So what I want to do now is share some of the, the research. And I mentioned earlier, there's probably 20 years or longer, um, maybe, maybe even 40 years of research. I, went, I, I found some um, research from 1980. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a new concept. But I want to share with you just kind of some high level key points of the research. And uh, we'll also share some links for those of you that want to you know, dig further and, and, and look at the evidence yourself. But um, we, we um, first, let's talk about the, uh, the need for skills in the future. The uh, World Economic Reports, um, which you know, takes a survey of uh, global organizations about you know, what, what, are, what is needed for the future of work. So in industry, uh, whenever students are coming to work from college, uh, what, what skills do they need, okay? So uh, Eva, I also got the, the link to this if you wanna throw it in the chat for the World Economic Forum report on this particular topic. But the, the report says that 94% of businesses say that they expect people to learn new skills on the job, which is an increase because in 2018, only 65% said the same thing. When these organizations were asked which skills they most wanted to see developed, um, they listed critical thinking, problem solving, active learning, resilience, stress, tolerance, creativity, and flexibility. Eva, does that list sound familiar to you? Yes. I see those words almost every day <laughs> in our work. Right. But if, but if, we, go if we go back, let me just scroll back mm. up through the research here. You know, we, we, yes. the, the uh, you know, meaningful, joyful, socially interactive, actively engaging, iterative, social, physical, cognitive, emotional, mm -hmm. creative. So it sounds to me like... What, what, what this report is saying, although it's not saying it explicitly, but I'm, I'm drawing conclusions here, 
is that we need to have more play in education to meet this gap that's currently happening in the future of work. So um, let's, let's unpack this a little mm -hmm. bit more. And then um, also towards the end of this webinar, I'm gonna give you some ideas and some actionable things that you can do in a classroom to increase play uh, to meet this gap that's currently happening in the workforce. So the research also goes on to show that play can help build a wide variety of skills. Uh, if we think about the traditional play, uh, outdoor play, uh, playing in the gym, playing at recess, et cetera, it's very easy to see that students are gonna build physical skills with running and, and jumping and, and, and mobility. Uh, but there are other types of physical skills that students can learn too, such as about using tools so they can build dexterity and mobility with using tools and equipment. Um, students, when they're playful, are building creative skills with imagination, curiosity, and discovery. And they're also building those critical cognitive skills for problem solving, reasoning, and concentration. And so play, you can just, you know, kind of imagine how all of these skills are slowly brought out, you know, through the act of playing. Uh, but what the research is showing is that uh, the best way for us to develop these skills is through a little bit more of a structured type of play instead of that free open-ended play that happens on the playground. That kind of play is also super valuable, especially in building uh, you know, social skills for students. But if we wanna like really get them into problem solving uh, and concentration and reasoning, we design lessons and activities that are kind of game-based so that students can you know, really um, dig into those skills. The research also shows that uh, play can boost social skills. So I mentioned earlier, like the free form outdoor activities uh, are gonna help students build uh, empathy, resilience and communication uh, because they have to collaborate and they have to work together and they have to have trade-offs and they have to, you know, like, uh, you know, work, work together. So um, Eva, I think I have a link to the, the summary of, of this research that talks about the skills that students will um, kind of gather and harness as they play. And it goes into more detail about uh, the, spe the specificity of each of those skills, also with some ideas for how to um, engage learners in the classroom with play-based activities. Um, another area of research that I ran into is um, this idea called the pedagogy of play. And so the pedagogy of play uh, is a research collaborative between several different organizations. Um, Lego is, is um, adding to this in uh, UNESCO and uh, the International School of Billund, Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, the, uh, the, the Ministry of Education in Scotland uh, is uh, super on board with play in schools. And so what they recognize is I, I hinted at this a little bit earlier, but there is actually a conflict that's present currently in schools between play and the objectives of schools. So in schools, you know, schools have a timetable and we need structure and we need a uh, quiet time and we need to keep children safe and we have learning objectives and it's all very um, organized. Where play uh, is a little bit more chaotic, a little bit messier, it involves risk, it allows children to take charge instead of, instead of adults. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a bit of randomness that could happen. So uh, the pedagogy of play um, identifies with this, actually, this conflict and recognizes that in order for play to actually be successful in schools, we need to overcome this conflict. And so the way to overcome this conflict is through um, you know, looking at the research to show what are the best practices, uh, working with professionals, modeling, uh, having teachers attend professional developments about how to uh, include play, uh, and then you know, to ha have the, a transitory phase in which we slowly introduce play into the nature of the school system. So um, I think there's another link that I have for, for this particular um, research about the pedagogy of play. And, and this one's really deep. So you, if, if you wanna dig into the pedagogy of play, I'm just really scratching the surface the, of which there are lots and lots of um, really good information and strategies and procedures and evidence and examples. So um, I, I quickly kind of went through the research and uh, I'm leaving you with lots of opportunities to uh, research further. But I wanna talk to you now about some things that we can start to do in the classrooms to incorporate play and play-based learning. So here's a list of uh, purposeful, structured, play-based learning um, kind of uh, styles. The, the first one is game-based learning. And game-based learning is when you gamify an activity or you gamify um, the, the process of, of a project uh, where students are kind of like earning tokens and they're receiving points and those points add up. And you know, there's, there's some kind of a game mechanisms that are built into the structure of the learning. 
The next one is you can, you can just kind of like gamify pretty much any learning activity by adding rewards and token systems. The thing you'll want to be careful about, though, is that students are very aware whenever the, um, there is no authenticity to the gamification. So if, if you just say, um, you know, for, for every page of the math workbook that you complete, you get three tokens. Uh, the students, you know, after the first time that that happens, they're going to realize that this is a rigged system. You know, there's not really real, there's no real incentive here. It's just, you know, game, gamified that that isn't really authentic and it doesn't give students that, that agency that we're looking for. So if you do approach gamified learning, you know, think about how to do it authentically. Uh, tinkering, which is a whole other pedagogical approach, which is about uh, playing with, with new tools and technologies and materials and iterating through different ideas. Anytime we, we can bring outdoor activities to the classroom where students are outdoors and learning outdoors is a good way to bring in structured play. And then lastly, project-based learning uh, is really a whole different pedagogical approach in which students are learning through the project instead of uh, through single activities and through textbooks. Now, if I wanted to, I could probably do a whole webinar just on each one of these bullets. Uh, so it, it's hard for me to, to like share enough information about these topics in this single webinar, but I'm just giving you a taste of some of the things that um, you could start to implement and start to look at for structured play in schools. So another thing that the research shows is that if we are going to increase uh, play in the schools, it needs to really focus on student agency. And what we mean by that is that the students need to have some control. They need to have some say-so in what's going on. And, and this means that students should have the opportunity to make authentic and genuine choices about their learning. So they, they could, we, we, in, in project-based learning, we kind of call this voice and choice, where we give students that opportunity to, to, to um, choose how they want to show their learning. So, you know, sometimes we give students um, opportunities to share their learning, like if they're really good at uh, making videos, they can make a video. If they can make a website, they can make a website. Uh, if they can uh, put on a sock, a sock puppet play, then that might be some, some way for them to show their learning. Um, play, just like project-based learning and game-based learning, also comes with a little bit of frustration through false starts and failures. And so we have to be able to work through those difficult situations and continue on the journey of learning and use those as ways for us to learn past the failure. And the other thing that the research shows is that when students are co-creating with the teacher, the learning experience, they're much more likely to feel engaged with authenticity and agency. So ultimately, the goal of play-based learning is to increase student agency so that students feel like they're a part of the learning process so that they don't feel like it's just being shoved down their throat. It's not, they're not just being told what to do, but they're being involved in the learning process. So um, this is a chart that I, that I kind of put together. And uh, I don't know if you have seen, there's this meme with the, with the like, the, there's like the, the, the tiny brain and then you know, it gets bigger and then it ultimately like expands into ultimate consciousness. And so I thought it would be reflective of uh, these four different levels of how to embed play in the classroom. The first level is we're just adding play to increase engagement. The second level is we're adding play to actually address specific learning outcomes. The third level is we're playing, but we don't know the outcome of it. And we're going to learn a lot through that um, ambiguity. And then level four is when we have complete student agency and students are initiating the play themselves. So uh, it, it takes a long time for us to get through these four levels. It's very, very easy for any educator to uh, work in the realm of level one and level two. Working in level three and level four requires a bit of professional development. It requires some experience. It requires a community of people who are working together to support these ideas in, in playful learning journeys. So um, there's nothing wrong with being in level one or level two, uh, but if you are an educator who's looking to really benefit from the, from the uh, power of play, then your goal should be to ultimately move into level three and level four, which typically means that um, your whole school is uh, interested in this idea. So uh, typically, you know, when educators start to um, explore the ideas of play, they might do a few little things in their classroom, but then they want to see the wider school audience involved and they want administrators involved and they want to kind of shift and change the entire pedagogical approach of the school and really, you know, tap into the power of play. In order for that to happen, uh, several things are needed. The, the school needs a policy and it needs administrative support to um, make sure that playful learning is a, a huge part of the program. It requires professional development, uh, which allows teachers to co-create with students 
And it usually includes an ongoing reflection process, which means that we need to have what's called a dynamic curriculum. Most schools have a static curriculum, which means that you know, on paper, it says that the grade seven students are gonna, are gonna you know, learn from this textbook and that grade eight students are gonna learn from this textbook and we're gonna learn these learning concepts and it just kind of goes on and on. But a dynamic curriculum allows for, for flexibility and for play and for cross age connections so that the curriculum is a flowing moving body of work that is adapted to the individual needs of the student in their own time in that grade level. So uh, it may sound like a lot, it may sound like a daunting process, uh, but there are examples of this. Uh, Eva, if you could share the link, this link that I'm about to put in, into the chat or that Eva is, um, is the most comprehensive uh, document that I have found in all of my research about uh, ways to actually embed play in schools. And it kind of gives you, it's like a playbook line by line about how to do this and what are the benefits are and, and, what, and what the research has shown that uh, can be a, a effective ways to implement play along with examples and um, you know, th things that other schools have done that have already been successful with this. So we can kind of build off the success from other schools. So that's a lot of information that I've covered uh, in a short amount of time about play. Uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is uh, an opportunity that's recently come about that uh, the Lego Foundation is offering. And uh, the research also shows that uh, play, because of the benefits that I mentioned already, that it also helps students to cope with difficult changes. And haven't we all gone through a lot of difficult changes lately? Eva, do you agree that, uh, that this, this, is, this is something that the world needs is help with yes. coping with difficult changes? Yeah. Yeah, um, so there's a, fr a free course that's happening right now. Uh, it's called Coping with Changes, Social Emotional Learning Through Play uh, that was uh, designed with the Lego Foundation and it's free. Uh, I highly recommend this course for anybody uh, who's interested in play or helping children through changes. Uh, and I hope that this kind of um, activities and, and courses and professional development will be more available to educators because there really is a massive amount of power in play, which is why we called this webinar Tap into the Power of Play. Uh, it's, it's highly underrated and highly undervalued in the field of education. Um, awesome. That's kind of it for my part of the webinar. Eva is going to now talk to us about some of the ways and examples that BSD embeds play-based learning into our work and a little bit more about how you can get in contact with us uh, if you'd like. All right, Kate, thank you so much, Mark. Um, thank you for the recommendation of the course as well. I think I'm going to join that. I'm going to sign up for that soon. Um, cool. So uh, as Mark mentioned, I am going to show you uh, how BSD does it. So um, at BSD, we design lessons with play in mind. So for example, with our video game design course, um, we start the course um, with students exploring games um, through playing and tinkering with them um, to discover what elements are necessary for good game play. Um, and then followed by then, uh, by that, uh, we take students through the design process to make their own games. Um, and then students learn to um, incorporate um, the elements of good gameplay. Um, and then they learn how to code the games um, by using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So um, there are three ways you can bring BSD education into your classroom. Um, there is a start. So through START, uh, you uh, get access to our curated free projects. Um, another way to uh, bring BSD into your classroom is through uh, TEACH. So um, this is a single teacher subscription plan um, with access to our curriculum. Uh, the third way is uh, to uh, bring in our full range of curriculum support and professional development through BUILD. Um, so you can find out more about this on our website um, at bsd.education. I'll put the link in the, in the chat. Oh, yes, thank you. So here are some examples, and this is one way that you can, you can bring in um, BSD projects into your classroom um, starting today um, with our free projects. And Mark, if you can share the link for that as well, that would be super helpful. Yes. Thank you. 
And then finally, um, we really value your feedback um, on this uh, webinar. Um, and if you have some time, it'll be great if you can uh, fill in the, sorry, if you can fill in the feedback form, which again, Mark will uh, share the link to down there. All right, thank you so much um, for joining us. So now we will go into questions. So I will stop sharing my screen. Okay. All right, so um, we have two questions here um, mm -hmm. from the audience. Um, one is, how do we convince parents that play is useful in school? Well, that's a good question. I, I think the way I would frame it is kind of the way that I asked you those questions uh, by, by talking about the benefits of play and then asking, you know, uh, do you want your child to participate in these type of activities? And once they say yes, then they're already hooked. And then you say, well, actually, um, play is the best way for your child to participate in all of these activities. You know, so I think, I think that some, some learning has to happen. Uh, so I also recommend that, that uh, schools that are interested in more of a play-based approach uh, involve the parents and so that the parents are well aware of the benefits, the research, and so that parents can support, uh, you know, at home as well. So it's, it's about the education of the parents. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think by sharing some of the, the um, information and the links that Mark has shared today with parents, that would be great. Or once the YouTube video is up, feel free to email blast it to your to your network of parents as well. Yeah. Um, so last final question. So how can we go from surface level play to play based learning? Uh, that's a good question. So in, in my chart earlier, I kind of showed that there were four levels and level one is just using play uh, to engage the students so that, um, you know, you're, you're introducing play in kind of a surface level, but it's still in a way that students are, are feel engaged in the play. Uh, the next way to move up from level one to level two would be to look at your subject area standards. So whatever subject you're teaching, uh, look at your standards and just see if there are any kind of like natural elements where we could bring in some kind of a play-based activity or a game-based activity. Um, and um, you can also search uh, through, through online repositories of games and play-based activities, or you, know, you can use some of the curriculum that we have at BSD uh, to fill that need, uh, which you know, would kind of put you more like at a level two, level three. Level three is when we're playing with um, things and the, object, the, the, the end result is a little bit unknown. So I think our video game design course is a good example of that because we kind of set a template for how to make the video game. But then at the end, the students can really customize and manipulate that however they want. So the end result of the game that the students are going to making isn't known until they go through that process and actually make the game. So it's a, it's a stepping stone. It's kind of a scaffolding approach. I wouldn't expect a teacher to go from like a level one to a level four in the same lesson. It's more like a three year pr progression. Mm. Great. Thank you. So there, that's all the questions that we have today, actually. All right. Good. Yeah. Good. Great. Yep. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining our webinar. Um, and uh, keep an eye out on YouTube for the recording. And um, I will share my email here if you have any further questions um, about um, our projects. Uh, you can email me at eyfbsd.education um, as well. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.